I'm sure your teachers mentioned the idea of shielding to you to explain ionization energies, to explain atomic radii, and so forth. And that's really all the A-level spec requires. Now, some teachers might have gone a teeny bit further than that and tried to quantify the amount to which one electron shields another one. And the most common way in which they might have done that was just subtract the core electrons from the charge from the atomic number and said, OK, that's what's left in terms of your valence electrons or whatever is feeling that nucleus. Now, while that gives you a idea of what's going on, it's not really correct. Um, and so what we're going to do in this little extension topic is just take the idea of shielding and apply a well-established method derived by a chap called Slater to actually calculate, first of all, the amount of shielding and thus get the so-called effective nuclear charge. In other words, the charge that a particular electron actually feels from the nucleus. Now, very quickly, just a pretty little picture. Here's an atom. Um, described in the orbit setting, which of course is usually a very good way to think about um, uh, an atom's properties. Just think about it in terms of its shell structure. So there's one electron in the first shell. There's a second electron in the first shell. Now, when you look at this picture, you're thinking, well, those two electrons don't have any effect on each other at all. But of course, remember, in reality, we don't think of electrons being in orbits. We think of them being in orbitals. And orbitals are not a fixed distance from the nucleus. So one of these electrons, let's pretend this one, could quite easily actually be closer to the nucleus than this electron. And of course, that would mean it could shield it. So the first thing to remember is even electrons in the same shell, even in the same subshell, can shield each other from the nucleus. And then, of course, you throw in another electron or two into that second shell. Both of those are shielded by those two inner electrons, and they're also going to have an effect on each other. So therefore, we need to take all that into account. And as I said, put together by a chap called Slater. All right. Now, first of all, let's get some terminology. Z is the atomic number. S is a so-called shielding constant okay and so when you take the actual nuclear charge and you subtract the shielding constant that's the amount that a particular electron is shielded by all the other electrons in the atom then you get the effective nuclear charge this is the nuclear charge actually felt the positive charge felt by that particular electron now in order to calculate the first of all, the shielding constant, and then of course the effective nuclear charge. You first of all need to write the electrons in this order. Change the electron configuration ever so slightly. So it is in terms, first of all, in shells. So we'll see the first shell, then the second shell, then all of the third shell, and then all of the fourth shell, and so on. And then separating out the S and the P from the D electrons. And then of course, if we were to go further, which I'm not really going to do today, um, we'd separate out the F as well. It's very important you put them in this particular order. Okay, the 3S and the 3P we can think of in terms of our usual regular shell idea, but the 3D is of course weird, right? The 4D is weird, the 4F is even weirder. Now, once you've written out like that, pick the electron that you're interested in. If that electron is an S or a P electron, well, then the way that, Shelter cal that, that Slater excuse me, calculates the shielding is just to use these little rules. And I'm just going to throw them up there without any real discussion about it, and then we'll exemplify it. But you can see that what we're effectively saying, this is how we're calculating shielding. So an electron in the same group has a small shielding effect, just as we discussed. This one can shield that one. This one could shield that one. Electrons that are in the n minus 1 shell, so in other words, these electrons compared to that one, shield more, 0.85. Okay, but it's not an entire electron away because sometimes this electron is going to be a little bit further than that electron because remember they're in orbitals, not orbits. But by the time you get to electrons that are further to the left, in other words, closer to the nucleus, than just the n minus 1 shell, then the Slater approximation is that those completely shield the poor little electron of interest. Now, if the electron of interest is in a D or an F, and of course we're not going to worry with Fs, but we are going to do a D calculation, it's much simpler. 
If it's in the same group, which of course means the same subshell for the D's and the F's, then there is a 0.35 effect, but everything closer to the nucleus has a full one electron shielding effect. So let's do a couple of examples. So that's the rules, no point in memorizing those. Let's think about a chlorine atom. Chlorine, of course, Z is 17, 17 protons in the nucleus, so 17 electrons outside. So let's write those out, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. Now, of course, the whole idea is that these electrons are going to not all feel, in fact, none of them feel the full effect of the 17 plus in the nucleus. As we get further away from the nucleus, they're going to feel less and less of that 17 plus. They're going to be shielded by other electrons electrons in there. And the whole idea of what we're doing here is we're going to calculate the shielding constant and thus the effective nuclear charge for one of those 3p electrons, one of those five 3p electrons. So let's rewrite the electron configuration as Slater suggests. So we've got the first shell, the second shell altogether, the S and the P in the third shell. We don't have to go further because chlorine doesn't go further itself. Now I'm going to color code things pretty neatly. So, for example, we're looking at the 3p electrons, so thus in pink are all the electrons in that same group, and each of those shields by 0.35 all the other electrons in that group. Now, the electron in the n-1 shell, so in this case that's the second shell, are worth 0.85, and I've got these in this pretty little blue colour. And then all electrons that are further to the left in purple, in this case there's just the two electrons in the first shell, we say that both of those completely shield this poor little 3p electron. They're so much closer to the nucleus, we give them a full shielding effect. So let's put in some numbers to calculate the shielding. 2 times 1 for the 1s electrons, 8 times 0.85 for the electrons in the second shell, and 6 times 0.35 for the electrons that are in the same group, in this case, the third shell S and P's. Now, why 6, you say? Because, of course, we're looking at one of these 3p electrons, and it's not going to shield itself. So we add all that up. The shielding um, factor, 10.9. So the effective nuclear charge, how much of those 17 protons in the nucleus does that 3p electron feel? It's going to be 17 minus 10.9 or 6.1. So even though there's 17 protons in the nucleus, that electron that's in the um, third shell, whether it be actually in an S or a P in that third shell, if you think about it, is only going to feel a little bit over 6 plus from the nucleus. Now, I think that that's fun and cute, and there's lots of practice that you can do in the associated quiz. But let's just wrap up with a couple of fast examples associated with phenomena to do with electron configuration that you were taught back in year 12. And while there might have been some explanation to it, you might not have got the full picture. Well, we're going to apply Slater's rules and the idea of shielding to explain a couple of these. Let's start off with the potassium atom. You do the electron configuration of potassium and you get to argon. And then the question is, where do you go from there? Before you started your electron configurations, you would have thought, well, after argon, we'll continue in the third shell into the 3D. But then, of course, you were told, no, 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 it bypasses the 3D and pops into the 4S. So let's think about which in what way does shielding contribute to that? So let's do first of all the calculation. What if the next electron after argon is in the 4s? So that's exactly what we know happens for potassium's electron configuration. So that would mean that it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, nothing in the 3d, and then 4s1. OK, so that lot there is the argon and then we're putting the electron in the 4s1 and you can see I've started off color coding it. Right, electron in the same group, the pink. That's pink. Then electron in the n-1 shell. Well, this pink is in the fourth shell, so n-1 is the third shell. So all of those are worth 0.85, even of course there's nothing in the 3D. And then both the first and the second shell here are further to the left than the fourth shell. And so therefore they are in purple. Pop in the values. 
Same way we did it before, except I flipped it. So we got nothing in the same group because there's only one electron in there. Eight in the third, the n minus one shell, and 10, two plus eight in the ones further to the left. So that shielding effect is 16.8. Potassium, of course, has 19 protons in its nucleus. So 19 minus 16.8, 2.2. So in other words, if an electron, that next electron, that 19th electron past argon, goes into the 4s, then it feels 2.2 plus from the nucleus. What about, though, if we put the next electron in the 3d? So that would make this the electron configuration, S argon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, the one electron in the 3d. Now, of course, we're looking down here, electron of interest in the d, electron in the same group is pink, 0.35, and all electrons to the left, so that's the first shell, the second shell, and all of the ones in the 3s and 3p, because they're grouped differently from the 3d, remember up here, how Slater groups the electrons. So now, Popping those in, S is nothing times 0.35 because there's only one electron in that group. And again, it can't shield itself. Total of 18 electrons all to the left in the first, second shells and the 3S and the 3P. So the shielding is 18. So thus the effective atomic number 19 minus 18 is 1. So if the electron went into the 3D, it would only feel 1 plus from the nucleus. If the electron went in 4S, it would feel 2.2 plus. If you were an electron, where would you go? Obviously, you go into the one where you feel the most love, the highest positive charge. As our last example, let's address the idea of removing electrons to make cations. If you've got an atom that's in the S or P, it's easy. Last electron in is the first electron out. But you might remember for transition metals, it's different. As you are putting electrons in transition metals, they go into the D subshell. As you remove them, you first of all remove them from the S because that is a further out higher shell. See if we can explain that using our Slater's rules. So let's think about titanium. Titanium argon 4s2, 3d2. Let's think about removing an electron from the 4s. Well, here is, of course, the electron configuration of titanium 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d2, 4s2. We're looking at this electron here, right? Removing an electron from this. Well, let's think about how tough that would be. Let's think about how well is that electron attracted to the nucleus. In other words, let's calculate the effective nuclear charge. Well, I've made it pretty on for you again. There's the group we're interested in, so 0.35 pink. Here's the electron in the n minus 1 shell. Well, this is the fourth shell, so n minus 1 is the third shell. So that includes not just the 3s and the 3p, but here we got electrons in the 3d. And then, of course, everything further to the left, the 1s and the 2s and the 2p, are in purple because they're worth 1. So the shielding, 1 times 0.35, because there's one other one in the 4s. 10 times 0.85 and 10 times 1. Put all that together, 18.85. Titanium has got an atomic number of 22. So the effective nuclear charge felt by that 4s electron, 22 minus the shield in 18.85, is 3.15. How about if we remove a 3d electron? So now we're interested in this one. So this is now the one colored in pink because there's two electrons in that group and of course for d electrons everything to the left completely shields so s is one times the 0.35 that's in the 3d and 18 times one we don't count the 4s because that's further out it doesn't shield the 3d electrons to any extent in the slater approximation so that gives us 18.35 so the effective nuclear charge for that, 22 minus 18.35, 3.65. So the 3D electron feels 3.65 positive from the nucleus. The 4S electron feels 3.15 positive from the nucleus. Which electron is going to go? Well, the one that is not held as tightly. So we take away the 4S electron because there is less shielding on that than there is on the 3D. 3D higher effective nuclear charge felt by the electron, so stays letting the 4S ones go. Wasn't that fun? Hope you're enjoying these extension topics. More to come.